Sid, or call sign Sid, <laughs> also known as the Aussie Degenerate. Lovely. On, on Instagram. Mate, thank you for, um, well, you're in Adelaide. I am. To, you've, you've come through and we thought, oh, shit, we'll do this in person while we can. Yep. So, mate, thank you very much. No, that's all right. Happy to be here. Well, I don't know. Where, where do you want to start from? Ah, uh, look, you know, um, I'm a ex infantry corporal um, with a heavies background, and I uh, also did my combat first aider, which kind of led me to a medical pathway. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people think that you're someone else who's on this podcast a little bit, <laughs> who's actually getting interviewed actually tonight at eight o'clock. Yeah, he actually told me you guys are doing oh, that. Shit. Yeah. yeah, you're not Dave. <laughs> no, I'm not Dave. Yeah. Um, stop messaging me. You stop donating to me. I'm not Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can still donate if you want to support. Donate to me. Don't donate to Dave. Fuck he doesn't Dave. deserve any money. Well, you're about to figure out people are going to find out what happened to Dave as well. Yeah, yeah. That's a good story. He's in the hurt locker a little bit in, um, in hospital at the moment. He is, yeah. But everyone told me that he was dead. And <laughs> track and Nazi. Track and Nazi <laughs> thinks they're dead as well, yeah. Yeah, it was like, this guy's dead. And I text him. I'm like, you dead? He just sends me a photo of him all, like, fucked up on drugs. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I was. Like, okay. And the amount of people from other battalions who messaged me, like, is this guy dead? I'm like, I don't know. I'll text him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had some messages as well. A bit of people concerned and, yeah. Fuck. So what was it that first made you go, go across to Eastern Europe and into Ukraine? Um, so, uh, funny story. I was actually on COVID assist when the war broke out and, uh, the real operation. Yeah. The real right? operation. And, uh, I was on, uh, age care assist actually. Oh, even better. Yep. Um, and I got to watch the war on one of the TVs at the age care facility. And I, I was like, oh my God, what's going to happen? Like, is this going to be World War three kicking off or is this just going to be another conflict um what's going to happen and some time passed from then on and i just kept monitoring the war um figuring out what uh what what's going to happen is this going to extend is australia going to get dragged in uh because back then no one really knew like the wars progressed now and it's obvious that the australian involvement is is limited but um but at the time i didn't know uh, and it kind of got to a point where it was like, well, um, I was seeing documentaries about Butcher and Erpin, about the rapes, the mass graves, um, bombing of civilians. And that kind of led me to, uh, to make that decision where I was like, well, I don't need to participate in the conflict per se. That was my original thought. And I said, I'm going to head over there and attempt to do some good and just help civilians as best I could. That's, that was the original plan going over yeah yeah and we well, like you said you were currently serving in the military yeah at that time yeah you went about i guess leaving a career as a corporal uh, a lot of military during the world a corporal isn't as senior as it is in the australian military like yeah. you're a corporal after a few years for australia you know it can be six seven eight years before you're a corporal and if you do it in four years you're pretty good but it's a bit of a career it is thing, yeah man. you're heading over to something that's not another paying gig how, how do you sort of justify that that movement out at least to your friends and family um so I actually uh didn't tell many people uh, my family didn't know either um once i was over there i did mention to them and i told them but um it was easy to justify in my mind because i joined to serve people serve the australian army and serve the australian like population but um but to be honest there's just not, not nothing happening in australia i wasn't going to feel fulfilled uh, in that egotistical way that I wanted to help people. Uh, I wanted to feel good about myself by making other people feel good. So um, in that kind of weird way, but the best way to describe it, yeah. So it was an easy decision because it was like, well, I can pursue this career in the army and I don't really get anything out of it. Like I can train troops, I can lead a section, um, but my fulfillment was actually doing the job. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, and do you find that with a lot of guys who have headed over to Ukraine that, you know, current in the West, you know, we've basically been in peacetime for, like, the combat trips in Afghan, at least for the regular militaries, basically dried up in 2014, 15. Yes, there was some stuff following that, um, and, you know, both of us are Afghanistan veterans, um, but, you know, it wasn't that combat door kicker operation. Do you find that for a lot of guys that headed over, it's like, well, I've trained for four six ten years doing this stuff 
I've never actually got to do it because our training was always for, um, uh, is it the war, not a war, yeah. or a war, not the war. But we don't train to fight guys in sandals in the desert. We train to fight, literally, we train to fight Russia. That that was like all yeah. the military doctrine. Yeah. And we call them the Mulzarians. was like our yeah. made-up fake bloody um, op for that we would fight. But it was like... Well, they've all got AKs and they've got BTRs. <laughs> it's like I, I wonder who these guys are meant to Yeah, be. yeah. I always found that funny actually on exercises. It'd always be like uh yeah, BMPs, BTRs, like yeah. Russian vehicles, Russian doctrine. Uh and then yeah, and it's funny speaking to current serving dudes now, trying to explain to them that that was the case for so long. Yeah. Now we've kind of moved towards a more China focused or date. Yeah. But uh yeah, at the time and still to this day really like there's still trench warfare and still still things like that uh for your question though like over there a lot of guys um will do their kind of their career in army and if they haven't deployed or even to that afghanistan deployment it's just a different world you're looking at like a threat that is just substantially higher than any war of like i think the world has ever seen a, a, a war that drones can sit over the top of you and drop a grenade and there's nothing you can do about it you just have to sit there and eat it so um or just getting shelled or you know pretty much yeah and a true 24-hour battle space too as far as the real major conflict where both sides have very good night fighting thermal mm -hmm. capability and we had that in other conflicts but never in large-scale conventional like this but every time we've had it the enemies has been limited where at least at the start of the war, it was the Russians had more night fighting stuff yeah. and thermal than, than Ukraine and the, the foreign fighters did. Yeah. It's a crazy battle space. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Props to Ukraine. They uh, they put in the work. And I don't think people truly realize that. Like, people love to put the, uh, oh, well, the US helped and the NATO helped and everything like that. But at the end of the day, it's Ukrainians on the ground. It's Ukrainians doing the work. Mm -hmm. So give them props because they managed to stop the Russian invasion up until this point to this day and are still fighting the good fight and everyone thought they were going to be crumbled in two weeks. So, yeah. Well, less than. Uh, well, I, think I mean, you were there, too. Right? I was there, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, you, you said when you are in the bloody um, op Brony assist talking about, <laughs> you know, looking talking after to all these, what every infantryman have signed up to do. Yeah. Um, you have had that war and you're like, oh, this is World War Three. That's how I felt when and I was in bloody... Kramatorsk, <laughs> like, yeah. oh, this is this is happening. This is real, and it's a lot different when you see like a cruise missile. And you're like, oh, this isn't some dude in sandals with with an AK. This is a real military. Oh like, yeah. This is a, well, we, you know, and I think a lot of our propaganda is to blame for how powerful we thought Russia was. Um, this is this is a, a superpower coming in. Like, this is going to get flattened in days now. Yeah. And like you said, bloody. Credit to them, the Ukrainians did not let that happen, which, and like you said, people, oh, they've got weapons and this and that, but at the end of the day, it's just weapons. The blood spill to the vast majority, other than the few volunteers like yourself who have mm. gone over, is all Ukrainian. They are, yeah. It's, it's it's one of these, no matter how this war ends, the the history will tell about this like valiant fight over the third war. Now we're almost two years in. And we don't know what the next two years hold, but like, holy shit, like you held back. It's like, it's like, you've met, well, it's sort of like if we thought America invaded Mexico, Mexico held off. <laughs> now, of course, we know that America and Russia are not a similar military, but bloody pre last year, we thought it was not too far off. Yeah. And, and I think uh, even thinking about it in terms of us, Australia, we're such a small military. Mm. We rely so heavily on NATO, but in the event that the US doesn't come to help us, we might be fighting that uphill fight. And I think a lot of lessons get learnt when you look towards Ukraine because yeah. they were such a small group, a lot of support, but were able to stop that larger force. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as well, I think this has actually given a lot of Australians confidence in our defence that if, let's say, Russia and China have similar capability, like we know China's is now greater, but, you know, not too far off, I guess, at least at the beginning, and they weren't able to invade the country next door across literally grassy flat fields. How much chance really does does China have on Australia of coming across a few thousand kilometres of ocean and then you land in the north and it's like before you get to anywhere that really matters, as far as Melbourne yeah. and Sydney, <laughs> you've got 4,000 kilometres of desert. Like how, and you know, 
that your boats are just going to get sunk by aircraft. Like the amount of American F-35s, F-22s, B-2s that are permanently in Australia now. Good luck. I think I think it actually gave me a real like, oh shit, this isn't going to be, like if China did do something, it's going to be probably a bloodbath on their behalf coming across. Like, yeah. I hope so. Yeah, I can't imagine China coming to Australia. Like it's just too, it's a distance. That there's too many uh, of their enemies close to them as well. That it just would, they would never get to that point, I don't think. No, no. But pe- people do think it's a realistic threat, but I think it'd be more of a economic, political try and influence rather than actual hot war. No one wants hot war. It's too expensive. Look at everyone's economies. Yeah. And this is a, in Ukraine is really a relatively small hot war comparative to like much more players involved and everyone's worried about money. Mm. Like imagine how expensive this would be in like a large scale, more than two countries involved. Hot. It'd be insane. Yeah, it would be crazy. So when did you actually, or about when did you actually head across, or sorry, start actually into the country and then sign up and actually want to do more military uh it was about a year ago yeah yeah about a year ago and how did that come about once you got there you know your plan was to help people when did you shift and go actually i want to incorporate my military background to this uh so kind of from the start it was always that way i joined a ngo that was uh in poland and their goal was to cross into ukraine yep. um so like gathering people and crossing over and so it was meant to be a medical group. Um, and there were some ex-serving dudes uh, in that group and some civilians who had just had um, medical qualifications. Um, and during that time in Poland, I uh, got to do some training with some Polish SF guys. And then uh, they were also running a combat medic course, which was really helpful for me because uh, only being a combat first aider, to really um, push the boundaries of my like medical knowledge and learn a lot more um, for example criking ios uh, like eye gels intubation um, blood products ke- ketamine fentanyl you name it, it was all there so uh, i was actually really lucky and that ended up being a uh, like civilian recognized uh, course so i was actually very help very helpful especially going to ukraine because um you don't really have a piece of paper that says, hey, I'm a combat first aider. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so having that as well, that they could, if you're trying to get hired by someone, having that helped to um, kind of like, hey, I, I do know what I'm talking about. I did pass the course. Mm. Yeah. And how was it when you first, I guess, put that into into actually action on on people? Um, within that, within the NGO space, I actually never got to treat anyone. Um, so what happened was, was, um, Pete Reed had just recently died. This is while I was already in Ukraine. Uh, and the Russians, uh, Pete Reed was working for an NGO. Um, and his team pushed out a little too far into Bakhmut, uh, when Bakhmut was falling and the Russians targeted him with an ATGM and, uh, there's a horrible, horrible video of it. Um, and pretty much from that point forward the ukrainian military was like hey no more civilians near the front line like this is just too risky it's not it's not you can just go to that country and pick up a weapon anymore it's everything needs to be on the books everything needs to be like verbatim how can we start proving that these people are qualified medically or because we can't just give these casualties to some dude who claims to be a doctor you know where's the proof um so yeah within that ngo space i never got to treat it wasn't until i actually went um and joined the military is when uh that that happened right and how did that all come about of you actually joining the mill um so yeah it was after the kind of ngo fell apart because um we couldn't conduct our medical work that we wanted to uh we were trying to organize an ambulance um but afterwards uh we kind of just started reaching out to contacts, messaging people, hey, we, I knew I didn't want to join the Legion. I'd heard horrible things about the Legion. The Legion has a lot of issues. Um, it has benefits as well, joining the Legion, but it just wasn't what I wanted to do. Wanted to do. Um, so yeah, I was just reaching out to people and um, eventually I got into contact with some dudes in GUR Legion. And then that's kind of uh, the path that I took. Yeah. And when was it that you first, I guess, came into contact with not only... Because you were mainly working as a medic overseas. Yeah, I, I pretty much worked 
as a combat first aider. So I was actually super lucky because it was pretty much this exact spot that I wanted to be is where I fell myself into. So just like a medic attaching to teams yeah. uh, and then going to work with them. And, and how, did, how did that first come when you first were actually like on the ground doing shit with the boys? Uh, yeah, so it was pretty wild actually, my first first mission, first real mission. My first actual mission was um, waiting at a Kazvac point in a Kazvac vehicle. Yeah. Um, my second vi- mission was actually on the ground. So I attached to a, a team and we were like, um, we were a QRF for an assaulting force. So there was like, you know, one section that was going to conduct the break in and do the assault. And then we were in the rear with the gear in a sense, yeah. uh, just a couple, couple hundred meters back or probably even a hundred meters back, if that, uh, in some, um, trenches, just in cover, just waiting. Um, and so, yeah, it was pretty wild. Like I remember what, as we infilled into this place, um, I had BMVDs on a 5.56 rifle. I've got kit that's very similar to the Australian Army. And I remember thinking, like, I could be on exercise right now. This this feels exactly like an Australian Army exercise. Yeah. Um, the only difference being is that, like, the first thing I look up and see white phosphorus popped and was, like, raining down on some friendly positions. And then some cluster munitions had just exploded, like, in the sky up on the the right hand i don't know how many hundred meters but i could hear it pop and, and spin and shit rounds out um and explode and i was like okay yeah no this is this isn't an exercise you know um even the guy in front of me had the same assault bag we carry just in multicam with a 66 slung like it was verbatim i was like this is crazy Fuck. um and so yeah we get the way you kind of get infield into some areas is because everything is just mines so uh it's always like a proven path Mm. so you pretty much follow a track plan all the way to get to everywhere in the front line so um because we had just entered this ao we didn't have anyone on our teams that knew the area so you have to enlist like a ukrainian um in a local unit who will come over and guide you and so you just get guided throughout um that place and and the first thing that actually happened to me that was proper was uh we were being guided uh, they split you up because the Russians target big groups of people. It's kind of their their whole thing with the artillery. They want to like inflict a lot of casualties. So you break up into really small groups and there might be like one Ukrainian, three of you kind of thing. So you, everyone was splitting up and there's quite a lot of us. So it takes a lot of time to kind of get past all these checkpoints and different positions all the way to the front. And uh, just as we'd come out of one position and we're, we're running along, um, we'd kind of just got to the final point where we were going to wait for everyone else to catch up, kind of consolidate. And um, there was this big gully right beside us, like on on my right hand side. And it was probably like a story and a half deep. It was quite large. So you had to like literally slide down into it. And just as I slid down, I was like one of the first to slide down. And uh, even at the time I was thinking, okay, we're off the track now. I've got to be careful. And I kind of look up, to my uh, left and I'm looking at the other guys sliding down as well and um, a, just a huge explosion just pops like maybe less than 30 meters away mm-hmm. and I was like oh you know I was safe in this gully but it just it popped outside and I remember hearing just before the explosion some like tree branches snap yeah. and I was like god what the f- what the fuck was that I, I had no idea. I'm like, I just am hearing an explosion. I don't know how to tell what kind of explosion. So I'm asking like, what, what was that? What, is this normal? Like, do we have to do anything? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. is, you know, our drills in the army is like, go down to the ground, like fucking like the IDF drill, but it's not, you don't do that. You're just like, so what? There's always artillery. There's always explosions. Yeah. So he's got down and, and then someone goes, we think it was an ATGM. Um, and so one of our uh, Intel briefs, we knew that, uh, from Bakhmut, they could fire uh, ATGMs and get like a good five, six kilometers out of that and hit. So that's what we think had happened mm. is they'd seen us coming up and they'd fired an ATGM. Mm. Just They just lobbed it, you know. It's just what they do. They've got the munitions. They can just throw shit and not care about it. So nothing else happened and, and we were safe in the cover, but it was quite dark. I had my BNVDs down and I'm just kind of hanging out. Uh, and then the other group rocks up finally 
and we have to push down and spread out because I'm like, okay, you know, I'm a good infantry soldier. I, uh, I spread out yeah. because uh, I need to make room for the rest of the call sign to be able to fill into this position. So I'm like, sweet, got to push further into the bush. Off I drudge. I was like the furthest out from the group now, pushed out, and um, I lay down on these logs, and I'm kind of just laying there, and I'm doing the old, uh, the old adage where you look at your uniform and you see – when the three colors, you can spot the difference between the three colors. That's when you take your MVGs off. Yeah. I don't know if you got taught that at Singo. Nah, never, no, never, yeah, never, that's never what some of the secos right. and stuff would be like. Yeah, when you can distinguish the three colors between your uniform, yeah. that's when you're good to take your MVGs off. Like, because oh, wow. you, you always wonder, like, when? What's the time where I'm like, MVGs off? Yeah. I'm off when they start getting uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> see them just white lighting. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I'm like, all right, sweet, MVGs off, flip them up. And like, and now I'm having a proper good look and I'm staring at this log that I'm laying on yeah. and I'm like, hmm, I don't think this is a log. And, uh, I, um, I have another look. I kind of like do a little bit of a push up to look down and I'm laying on top of like a, uh, a UXO. Oh shit. Yeah. So it was like a tandem, uh, RPG warhead and the front had exploded, but the rear was still intact. Um, so I look. I'm no EAD guy. I don't know how dangerous that is. I do know the RPGs have like a self um, detonating kind of thing. I think it was 600 meters. Yeah. They self detonate and that's over enough spins or however it gets uh, the fuse. All I knew was that that was not okay to lay on. And yeah. so I was like to my EOD guy that was right next to me. I'm like, dude, can I, <laughs> can I get up? What should I do? Do I move? Like, have we got it? And he's like, I wouldn't lay on that if I was you. I was like, yep, all right, Thank sweet. You. <laughs> yeah, I did a bit of a slow push up yeah. and moved along because, uh, yeah. And then off we go um, into the uh, position and then occupying our QRF position yeah. ready for the mission to start. Um, yeah, so that was just like, just that whole front thing was kind of this big hit to me. You know, like, all right, we're, we're kicking on. I got to start. Th I, I would get overwhelmed with like so much shit going on. Yeah. And it was that point where I like, right, settle, like think, because I wasn't thinking properly either. That was one thing I definitely uh, needed to think about. It was like, all right, I need to start like actually thinking like a soldier again. Like what's next? What should I do to prepare? Just just general thoughts that you have to trying to be a better soldier. Um, yeah, so I really got to pick up a lot better there. Well, it's fucking surreal though. When you head into an area, like anything like this, it's surreal. You're like, oh, I'm actually... I'm actually here. Like, like this is actually like other. That, they're Russian soldiers shooting over here. Like, yeah. It, it's. I know this sounds stupid, but it is surreal when you're like. And I had the exact same just in Israel. You're like, oh, this is actually like I saw this on the television, and now I'm seeing it in full HD on my eyes. It's like fucking surreal. Yeah, I think it is the weirdest thing to think that someone is staring at you. Mm. Like, you just don't... It feels so personal. <laughs> Someone's yeah. looking at drone footage or through a thermal of you and they're pulling the trigger on something to try and kill you. Yeah. And you're like, it just... I don't know. It's, it is a bit of a weird thought to have because oh, then you yeah. would think the same because you're looking at them and trying to kill them and it's just... Yeah, it's an interesting experience. That's oh, wild, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's wild. I don't know when I head back to, into like Kharkiv like because i was there for a couple of weeks before the war and then you know for months following it's surreal being like oh this is the city that i was drinking beers in singing karaoke like yeah what like it, it it feels weird and what then happened you know once you infilled into that mission um so yeah we were in that qrf position um for a little while the it was like the section, there was two attached medics. There was one, me and the other guy, like as part of our med team. And then uh, we had one or two EOD dudes kind of like all shoved into this one large pit. Um, and it was just like hurry up and wait kind of thing. Um, we just had comms with the front group and it was just continuous conversation. We're just like monitoring, hey, what's going on? And they would just be like, uh, one of the methods that we used to clear like surface laid stuff was we, I think it was Mon 50s, which is like the Russian claymores. So uh, the Soviet claymores. And so we would use them to like, hopefully detonate an area and just kick up enough shit to flip like a surface laid mine and potentially would go off. Um, so the EODs do is just, they're great guys, like props to them. Cause um, no missions that I was ever on. We ever had like an incident with uh, a mine or anything 
wow. with EOD. Yeah. Like, because they could just, they were just spotting everything, like um, taping, like blue tape or whatever we were using on the day and, and making sure we were um, all safe on that. But yeah, so they're just working away at clearing, uh, like, a posi- enough position up to get to this Russian position. Um, but while we're in that QRF position, we'd heard a lot of drones flying over and they kind of hover and you never know if they're friendly or not. So you just kind of look up and decide, do you shoot at it? No, do you not? Who knows? Um, but as that happened, then we started getting, uh, this is another fun thing. A tank started shooting at us. So, um, actually before I went over, I did a lot of research and I, I was like, oh my God, the Russians are using tanks with indirect fire now. And so that's what this tank was doing. So it had a drone like um, guiding its fire and then the tank would just lob rounds. It only lob about two because yeah. then it has to uh, jockey out of position and, and relocate because um, if a tank stays in the same position, someone's going to fucking locate it with an FPV and, and kill it. So yeah, we had this tank firing at us for a little bit um, and it would just be sporadic every 15, 30 minutes. It'd come back two rounds and then it'd bug out and you're like, oh, whatever, like... Just lay there and hope it don't get hit. Yeah. Um, and then we also had our friendly unit on, like next to us, was also conducting an assault. From memory, it was um, Kraken, I believe. Right. And so they had a bit of a firefight. And so we started getting some rounds that would whiz over our head and just like cutting through the trees and stuff. Um, but yeah, we were just sitting in the trench completely safe, like as safe as you could be in that position, just waiting for our boys to conduct the break in. Uh, they did get to a point, um, we, cause we have drone operators as well, like attached to the teams and then drones, uh, external that would be like at a safe position. Uh, they spotted three Russians that were, um, in the position that we're trying to break into and they were watching them flee. So obviously at some point they'd spotted us, they'd identified that we were gonna like conduct an attack. And for anyone out there listening, um, when you look at someone through a drone and it's 4K and you can zoom in perfectly, they can tell what weapon you have, your equipment, you know? So you're looking at a bunch of guys with like cut down body armor, um, like Gucci 556 American weapons, uh, suppressors, all this kind of all this crazy stuff and they can see we're deading stuff and we're not just like running with like a ukrainian conscript so they know that we're a special unit um so obviously three guys had decided they don't want to take you know however many there were 16 18 of us and so they uh they withdrew out of that position and our eod dudes just kept clearing up um yeah once the eod guys well, once our team, sorry, not just the EOD, once the team got onto position, they just cleared all the pits because the guys had already fled. Um, and then we pushed up. After I got out of the trench, kind of walking over um, just along the, the path that we'll be guide, guided on. And yeah, that's where I started seeing just dead bodies everywhere. There's just dead Russians. Um, I didn't see any dead Ukrainians from memory, even my entire time in Ukraine. It's something that I was like very noticeable of is that Ukraine actually like takes care of the dead and remove them as best as they can. And then will actively like use missions of body recovery and stuff like that. But from what I saw personally of the Russians, it's just, they just leave them. Um, so yeah, I got to walk past dudes. Uh, they look, they're old, they're like 40, 50 years old, kind of like older gentlemen uh, laying there. One guy had his eyes melted out of the back of his head he'd been sitting in the sun so long kind of like resting and i remember thinking i was like this is weird because the guy's legs were like cocked up right. and i always just imagine that you just go completely limp but this guy i don't know he just happened to die with his legs up so um yeah it just i was like oh jesus all right and they smelled horrible and i was like yeah. oh that smell of yeah. death is something that really sticks with you too that like i always describe it people think i'm weird for this it's almost like a sweet smell but it's so recognizable yeah I think it's human instinct that we don't like it either. I think there's this certain s- smell that you just like. Don't go near that. That's, yeah. that's bad. That's bad meat. But and how did that feel when you when you came in and you first starting to see these like dead guys? Because yes, they're the enemy. But uh, seeing the dead guys, I was like, oh, this is just now like it's just a person. Like it's just yeah. some dead guy on the ground. Yeah. It, it becomes a bit more. Oh, this is another dude. I can look in his face. I think at the time, like, I didn't really care. I was just kind of like, fucking 
cool, you know, like a couple of dead dudes and I mean, they're the enemy, so why should I care? Um, now that I'm back uh, and I've had time to think about it, I definitely do think that I'm like, damn, like it kind of sucks because it is just a human uh, and it's just a dude. Uh, and you don't know, like maybe he was all gung-ho and he wanted to kill a bunch of Ukrainians or maybe he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like you don't know. And that's what kind of sucks about it. But no, I definitely at the time it didn't bother me at all and I didn't really care. And um, it's not going to affect my capability to conduct a mission. It's what I was, I knew I was getting myself into. Yeah. Did it feel more real at that point? I know for me when I first started seeing a lot of the dead bodies on the Kharkiv offensive uh, late last year, that's when I was like, oh shit, like this is, this is really happening here. I started to see it similar to yourself. Uh, a lot more Russian dead left. Like, so one thing that really haunts me, and I'm probably in a different situation because I'm not there as a combatant, yep. I'm there as a neutral observer, I guess, is a basement full of bodies. Uh, and just Russian bodies, and they're just thrown down there. Mm. And uh, it's like, holy, and a well full of bodies as well. And that became like more real for me at that point. Did you find that? At the time, no, no. Yeah. It was kind of like the mission's on and, and I don't have time to sit there and mull about who this guy might have been or do I care? No. Um, but like I said, like now I definitely think about it and I'm, I have a different opinion. Even if I return and continue the fight, I think I'll just adopt that old personality because yeah. I think you just have to adopt and just, just whatever. It doesn't matter. Well, you can't, can you? No. As a combatant there, you, you, you can't have this. You can't sit there and cry over uh, no. the enemy. Everyone will look at you a bit weird. Think, no, who yeah, the fuck yeah. is this guy, yeah. you know? Fuck it. This is his first, that guy this, is his, this is his first mission. Like, yeah. who is this loser? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but no, yeah, you just kind of get to get on with the mission and, and not worry about it. Yeah. yeah. And as a combat medic there, what were the sort of primary injuries that you were confronted with? Um, I actually didn't have to... Uh, do a crazy amount of um, things as some people might imagine. Um, there are, it's a, experiences may vary kind of um, thing for a lot of people. Uh, majority of injuries is shrapnel. Yeah. Um, because it's just an artillery war. And I think even in the sense, every conventional war is an artillery war or an explosion war, I guess you could say. Yeah. It's very rare people are shooting at each other. It's very rare people see each other. You just, yeah. it's a drone or it's uh, artillery or something along those lines because why shoot your enemy when you can make them explode? Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is something that people have this idea of of soldiers is you're there kicking in doors, shooting at a... Like, that is a 1% or less of It's not less Call of, of Duty. Time. It's not Call of Duty. And, <laughs> no. and that situation is that dangerous. It's either you or him at that point. It's a 50-50 thing that majority of this is long-range artillery and i think people don't understand how long artillery can actually fire yes. especially when looking at things like grad and explosion like you said of missiles and drones yeah. like my shitty drone that i've got in there has like eight k's of range um, and that's an old one yeah um and i know ukraine's figured out ways to extend them and all this sort of stuff that a lot of soldiers have never actually seen a combatant like alive at yeah. least. And, then, and that goes for the russians the ukrainians the foreigners whatever including the, the Aussie or the Yanks in, in Afghanistan. There's plenty of guys who have been in firefights, but I didn't see anyone. Yeah. Like, like, I was just suppressing it. Like, you know, I'm like, well, they're, they're somewhere in that direction, so I'm suppressing that pit. But it's not rare for soldiers not to actually be involved in that way or to actually see them. It's actually uncommon too. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely a huge misconception within... Uh, even our defense force, I think a lot of guys think that they're going to see the enemy. If you see the enemy, you're going to shoot them because yeah. that's the whole point. You know, you see the enemy, you're not going to have a whole lot of occasions where you're seeing the enemy and uh, you're not shooting them and you're just thinking, oh, well, I saw that guy. Like, no, no, it's a war. Uh, yeah. And you got to keep your head down. It's an artillery war. So, yeah, I'm going to be sitting in a trench and I'm not going to be sticking my head out looking for <laughs> Looking for dudes because that's how you get hit. Yeah. yeah. In your time there, did Russia seem to have the advantage at least on the uh, the quantity of the artillery? Uh, it's it's so consistent and uh, 24-7, you, I just couldn't tell. Like um, there's definitely some things that, that, um, that made me think like, okay, they definitely have like a little bit of a, a one-up, but... Um, but there wasn't anything ridiculous. Like it's just, it's a bat game of battleships. 
I've heard someone explain it like that before. It's just literally just counter battering each other consistently. And in between that, occasionally you get shelled. Yeah. That's all it really is. Yeah. It's fucking crazy, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess there's a, like, from a lot of guys I speak to and a lot of like Aussie guys, they talk about this quality versus quantity fight that the Russians have a lot more guns and ammo, but the guns aren't as good quality as like the M777s or the Caesars or something. So it's like a, which one would you prefer? <laughs> yeah. That that's sort of what's happening. Yeah. I, I honestly, I wouldn't know enough about um, artillery, but like if you integrate HIMARS, for example, uh, that creates this whole new capability. It's the quality, it's the range. It has these, like, it's a new step uh, in like a uh, avenue of warfare that Ukraine can now conduct. But if you're um, using artillery weapon systems and it's like, would you want, you know, five of our wonderful M777s yeah. or do you want, you know, 20 of their crummy like 105s or whatever they've got? Yeah. I think you're going to take more over less. It's just it's because you can just counter battery them. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's difficult. It's, it's, a, it's a funny war on that. And I think it brings up a lot of discussion in the West about do we, are we too concerned on the technological aspect of things rather than the quantity of quantity of things? And I've spoken to a lot of guys and I'll see if you agree or disagree with me that I think the Australian army, we're too focused on the individual soldier, at least the infantry, being like a tier two special forces soldier when the infantry is the infantry. The infantry is, yeah, you're clearing areas, you're, you spend, you're a lot of times you're sitting in trenches taking artillery and forward assault rather than this Gucci shit that the Australian, if you look at the Australian infantry video, this is SF only five years ago of the drills they're doing. The, I'm not saying that isn't great and it isn't fun, but the amount of training you do that's sort of not relevant, I guess, to the actual infantry mission. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. In a shit, I don't know, <laughs> a shitty way to put a question. No, for, yeah. There's no question mark in there, but. I, yeah. I, yeah, I'm a little bit, um, like, I have a little bit of an opinion about this topic just because, um, yeah, I, I, I think. We have to start thinking about if you, uh, the Australians have to start thinking about like what are we thinking we're going to be fighting. So, in my opinion, it's going to be in the jungle, and worst case scenario, it's in Taiwan as like worst case. If we get dragged back into the Middle East, we're leaning on twenty years of experience there. I'm sure we'll be fine. But in this new, what's going to happen next? I think Australia has like um, I don't know. We're taking a really weird direction because, like you said, we're kind of like role-playing sf dudes uh for example myself i even did while i was in the australian army this like two commando dogs um came over and assisted us with like a helicopter insert <laughs> into a into a, like an urban complex and we cleared that and it was like what had that had anything to do with being an in infantry mm -hmm. like at the end of the day it's seeking out close to the enemy and it's also um it's combined arms it's trenches potentially if it's like this kind of war or it's in a peer on peer forces and uh, doing your slick urban drills and everything like that is, is great. And it's applicable in some scenarios, but it's just not. I just, I think we should focus more on like war fighting than we should on counterterrorism is the way I think we should be turning. Yeah. yeah. And, and I agree. Like you see the Australian military at the moment, like my battalion is shrinking or well, he's collapsing completely. Yeah. And we're collapsing numbers. And I'm like, no, if anything, you want to boost numbers up like have guys yeah i know each infantryman costs a million dollars to have well maybe don't have the amount of random training on on shit like yeah. combined arms mechanized combined arms is incredibly important and it's very difficult to do and we don't do enough of it because we're too i think sometimes we're too focused and i've been out for a couple of years now so i'm not current with anything but from what i see it's too focused on like you know slick urban drills rather than no you're probably going to be in a trench for a week and then pick up in these vehicles, massive assault of a bloody battalion level, brigade level fucking assault through mechanized. And could we actually do that tomorrow? Like realistically, could you go down to one brigade and be like, tomorrow, every NCO, every LT, all the officers, you're, com you're doing a massive combined arms assault. How would that, how would that actually go yeah. live? Like live fire? It would, yeah, I couldn't, Interesting. I couldn't imagine it, yeah. yeah. Um, and even to that point, like thinking um, for the Australian Army, 
how many times have we upgraded ourselves in that urban space? And I think urban is, we definitely need to, mm. but in terms of just like having these slick drills going through a doorway, I think we definitely need it. But um, how many times have we upgraded ourselves with how to conduct a carrier attack? Yeah. Or how many times have we thought about new ways to integrate our mortars, our artillery systems, like having uh, shared information on the battlefield between individual soldiers up to... At one point, I remember we had that system in a carrier, um, whatever the little computer in there was. Oh, the... The uh, battle, battle yeah, tracking. Yeah. yeah. The, what was that? And then I'm, I'm qualified on that. Yeah. But if you asked me to use it, I'd be like... It was in my Bushmaster OCs. Yeah. Never turned it on. Like, I, That's you know, exactly it was, right. It was in the crew commander's seat when I was the crew commander and I never turned it on. Yeah. <laughs> and to that point in Ukraine right now, every single person, every team, I'd say, definitely every team has a, a, an ops phone. Yeah. And then on that ops phone is an app like ATAC or Kropiva with updated information about exactly where the enemy is, exactly where your troop positions are. And it gets updated and um, you can even integrate it, call in mortars and artillery and all sorts of stuff. And it's yeah. like a conscript in Ukraine has a phone that he's, you have to correctly jimmy it up so it uh, can't be tracked and all these other things. Yeah. And you've got Starlink running as well. Um, so there's all this information share. And he's, this is just a dude who like fly, flies a random ass drone. Like he doesn't care, yeah. but he has all this information to his fingertips mm -hmm. Um, even like mined locations and things like that. But for the Australian Army, we ripped those uh, battle tracking computers out of the yeah. vehicles. And I know that, yeah, of course, we're probably moving to something else now. But like we are just so slow to catch up in these things because we're going into the third year of war in Ukraine. And this kind of stuff's been around since probably, you know, 2013, 2014, something like that. Mm -hmm. SF have been kicking around with it. And it's just that integration is uh it's just not there definitely yeah and well on the other side what do you think the australian army being an infantry corporal section commander prepared you well for over there um i definitely think being a corporal i actually spoke about this to one of the guys over there uh he brought it up but it was like you can't just be like a private over there like in the foreign imagine yourself in that foreigner role going to fight that um, being a ranked member, getting taught how to think for yourself, is just so important because over there, I don't have someone sitting over my neck telling me, face this way, here's your arcs and tasks, left of arc, right of arc, yeah. primary task, secondary task. No, it's like you figure it out yourself because like, it's just it's not how it works. So uh, it definitely helped to be a corporal where I was already in a position where I was having to think of myself having to think what's next or plan missions or do something like that. Uh, and then stepping into that world where I might not be a corporal, but like team leader position over there, but I still just as an individual soldier, like my decisions are my decisions and I'm making them like an informed, intelligent decision based on my own thoughts and like understanding the battle space, and collecting my own intelligence and things like that, making decisions. Yeah. Yeah, and say just for instance you were to step back into the Australian Army in a corporate position. Sure. What lessons have you learnt from over there that you would instil on your on your boys, be it medical uh, or yeah, I know there's a long one in this it's around around the use yeah. of um, drugs. Uh, I mean, drugs as far as giving guys drugs. Yeah. Uh, and tactically, what would it? What would you be instilling differently than what you first learned, like learned and got taught? Yeah. So um, for like medical wise, I'll, I'll try and keep it short for most of this, but for medical, uh, I personally would, I would question why we use the green whistle. And I would also question why morphine is the main drug and not the uh, fentanyl ketamine combo. Um, ket both have their advantages and disadvantages, but I would just, I'd question because all, pretty much all militaries everywhere else are up to date with like using ketamine. Um, and why we are still using morphine yeah. and how like that's a very dangerous drug uh, can kill a lot of people so um, especially if used incorrectly and we know how infantry soldiers are they are yeah. like tick and flicking courses and, yeah 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 um, so my understanding of morphine was always well you can give it under uh, above sorry 90 systolic yes uh, but my understanding of why we used that over ket was that you can use Narcan if you've if you overdose someone or naloxone 
to bring them back out of that because it's a opiate. Yep. Yeah. So that was always my understanding of why we hadn't gone down that path. But what would you say? Um, so if you give them too much ketamine, they're just the worst case scenario because the amount you have to give them for like OD on ketamine is like a ridiculous amount. So, um, so the amount that you will give for ketamine, if you OD them a little bit, the worst case is that they just go into the K hole. Yeah, I'm sure. Plenty of you guys have been to a festival. Everyone, everyone, yeah, everyone, this, everyone knows. Like, yeah. Everyone knows what K hole is. <laughs> uh, and you're just going to have a like, potentially unconscious patient, mm-hmm. um, which ketamine is short. Like that's the one problem with ketamine is it just doesn't last as long as morphine does. Um, but it is that fail safe where it's like phew, it doesn't matter. Like you you OD them a little bit too much because you don't know what you're doing, then the worst case is they're just going to have too much ketamine and they're injured, so they're going to be very thankful that you, you took them out of that uh, that situation. But, uh, yeah, I just I, I question it, and I, I'm myself doing my own research and trying to figure out why we've made that decision. As far as I know right now that we are switching to a ketamine, like uh, switching from ketamine to morphine, but I'm just not sure, like 100% that that's actually happening. Um, yeah, and then there's plenty of stuff in that medical space that I would happily introduce into combat first aiders. Um, I think that uh, during my combat first aider course, at that time, there was no requirement to actually cannulate a human. So the test happens on a dummy. Yep. And I think that's ridiculous. Like cannulating someone is just such a safe like it it's really like it's yeah. really not you're just sticking someone with a needle and you're meant to be qualified and have like a medic sitting over your shoulder actually watching you yeah so it's like this is seriously like it's actually life-threatening not to know how to cannulate a human yeah because almost every trauma casualty is going to get a can like an iv yeah so well one of the things at least on my course i'm hopefully i'm not getting anyone in trouble here um this didn't happen on my course no it was it was like, you know, you're cannulating on the dummies. Okay, we'll sign you off. And then it was, we're not saying to do this, but there are fucking cannula kits. Oh, here's bags. the kid over here if you want to take it here. home. If you want to yeah. take it home and practice on the dummy, it's a Friday night and you're probably all going to get on the piss later on. Yeah, you want some fluids. And tomorrow morning you're going to feel hungover. <laughs> and it, I think not doing that live is so silly. Like, yeah. I have no problem with anyone. Like, what's the worst? Like, well, like, it, it, nothing, nothing that you could just stick it straight in and it's yeah, like, oh, it's oh no, it put band aid yeah. quick. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think if you're at the unit right now, I'm not uh, influencing anyone's decisions, mm-hmm. but if you're at the unit right now and someone asks you, "Hey, can I can you you?" Just think that you're doing it for their benefit, not yeah. yours. And potentially, if they ever treat someone because car crashes happen or something crazy happens, you never know what scenario they'll be in, or if they deploy. I would rather someone be confident that they've done it a couple of times on an actual human, um, kind of shake their, their hands out a little bit. And um, and yeah, it also, I think it also for a combat first aid and nothing feels real until you're actually treating casualty. This is one of those things that you can do that is a real, like you're actually injuring someone's arm. You'll have blood come Yeah, to yeah. stick a, a, a IV inside of. So I think it's very important that people do um I think it should be integrated like immediately into the course and it's going to cost no money. It doesn't change anything. Yeah. It's just like you cannulate each other's arms as your final test or something, you know, that's yeah. what I would do. Yeah. You feel good after it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, get an IV bag. bag. You get yeah. A bag sure. Fluid, you get a liter or two of fluid. You realize how, how you're walking around dehydrated 90% of the time yeah. anyway. And I, I think you'll find actually like, this is a really interesting thing is like now I'm in Ukraine integrating with all these people from all over the world. So now I see everyone else's military from like different NATO militaries, the US, everyone, and how they operate. And the US doesn't care. Like they're like, oh yeah, we just like jam needles in each other, you know, stress cannulate each other or whatever. Yeah. And like, even when I joined the unit, um, we had some trainers that were there. And um, that was like, obviously I'd already cannulated plenty of people by that point. Um, But yeah, they were like, let's do some stress cannulation. So they got like a towel. We got waterboarded, we crawled through some uh, some sand just for the fun, mm. and then uh, run over to the casualty and, and actually IV them. And yeah. we did a timer and you know set a time and who can do it the fastest kind of thing. Uh, <coughs> I had the fastest time. Hey. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I just having a just having a little bit of fun with it because you know that's essentially like I could easily see that maybe not the waterboarding part, but uh, why why can't you do that kind of stuff in defense? Why can't you um, 
do these things that are, are real. And I actually spoke to a medic recently who's in the Australian Army, and she said to me that um, on her course, there was a medic that was afraid of blood, and she did not have to cannulate a, uh, a human. And I have never been so concerned <laughs> in my whole life. because Medic you, afraid of blood. If you don't know, medics in the Australian Army have to do a placement to a hospital or an ambulance yeah. or something like that to maintain their medical skills. Wow. And uh, yeah, this woman is going to go treat you at a car crash. <laughs> yeah and you, she's not going to know how to stab your arm so um that's an interesting one for sure what do you see the problem is with a lot of the medical kits that guys are carrying in, in their well i say med kit but Ooh, IFAC, IFAC. Ooh, yeah. it's always individual first aid kit it, it, that, that came in like half and I, i'm like what but yeah. um what do you see in the problem in that because i know like even when i was deployed very small slim IFAC. And then now what I carry now is grown dramatically to Ooh. what I actually use because I know how much more I'm actually getting to need. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it kind of ticks into the pretending to be SF role. I think uh, if you're in a special forces role and you've got this intricate detail of like medical personnel and all these kind of things who they know exactly what they're carrying and it's all slim line, sleek, and you know exactly what's going on. Sure, a micro YFAC, like the similar one that uh, is issued to the Australian Army right now, most guys are carrying. Um, that's okay in that specific circumstance. Yes, sure, carry one chest seal, you know, one bandage and one tourniquet, whatever yeah. your little crappy IFAC yeah. has. But if you're in the infantry, like you're, you're just, I don't, I don't want to say you're retarded. Like you're <laughs> retarded if you think that you're going to pull that thing out and treat yourself. Like one chest seal. What about the exit wound? Yeah. Like what if you've got frag? Frag isn't just one bit of shrapnel hits you. It's like a ver just your holes. All your body is just full of holes. Mm. So it's like uh, yeah. I think the old eye fact that we had, um, the the large one. And if you look at any of my photos, you'll see that that's the one I wear. Um, I jammed packed that thing. I, it was full. Like, I've never had a more full IFAC and it was a little bit annoying back there, yeah. but I knew that I had literally anything I like needed, um, especially if I got injured. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, that's one of the... When I was even in, there was problems with getting IFAC stores. Like yeah. dudes not having complete IFACs and not being issued to them as they come into the unit or all sorts of things. And then not having the training stores to practice with those as well was another issue. But yeah, definitely, I think get rid of the micro IFACs, go back to the, a bigger IFAC or create, if you don't like how it is or you want to figure it out, for example, the um, forward observation created that uh, like roll one IFAC on the back of your thing. Like if that's, in, I would not say that's the thing to go buy, but I'm just saying is that like we have to think about another way to have a more comfortable IFAC that has everything you legitimately do need. You need everything. You need we need quick lot, and people go oh, but they only give quick lot for deployments and be like well okay get non hemostatic gauze then yeah compressed pack gauze it probably costs like five cents less. You're saying the Australian government can't afford that yeah um, and use it for practice. It's gonna do a very similar thing that quick clot's going to do except it just doesn't have the hemostatic um but yeah no definitely i carry multiple tour how many tourniquets do you carry on your deployment uh well cfa so i carried more i how, think i would have had just on you yourself oh, no. i would have had two sorry two on the front of my body armor yeah and one in my left top pocket so i had three on me if i was in cams oh in kit yeah and some probably in a it, well i carried a cfa pack but without the without the first, without the combat first aid pack, three. Yeah. But it wouldn't be rare for guys to have one. Yeah, isn't that isn't that crazy? Like, well, I see a lot of journals with zero, like like in Israel, in Ukraine, wherever, zero, zero med kit, and I'm like, you, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, like I, the biggest thing I use in my med kit is fucking tweezers, getting out yeah. splinters all the time. But like, you've got nothing, and these sort of things. You can buy, like you can buy him set of calls, oh, and it lasts for. Look, look, they, 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 I've got shit in my kit that I've got on, from my deployment. Yeah, like my deployment was twenty seventeen, and it's in date for like another ten years. Like, <laughs> it, it, yes, it's yeah. thirty bucks, but it will save your life or one of your mates' lives, and it goes out of date in like 10, 15 years. It's all just written on the back. Like, this is shit you can have. 
Yeah, no, I, dude. It, Next thing, cops kicking my door. Yeah, like, yeah how dare you? Yeah, but no, Australia. it's yeah. like it's just medical supplies. Mm-hmm. Seriously, we should just be like throwing them at people because I. Here's another thing I've noticed as well is that you'll never realize how valuable life is mm-hmm. until you're in those kind of situations where it could be your death or it could be someone you know, you're one of your good friends. Which is you know, if you're sitting in an RER right now or a combat unit, it's like the guy next to you, you know. It's kind of weird to not think of Dave, you know, whoever the guy is, yeah. but it's so valuable that their life can just be taken away. And then you not having those medical supplies, oh God, you'll kill yourself. You go home and you will never live. Yeah. I think the U S army said something like, um, it was, it was along the lines of, we can't, uh, we can't force you to do it, but we can make you wish you, you did or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I think too, we have this illusion that we're not going to lose many guys in like, you know, in contacts, say in Afghanistan, whatever got, you know, you'd have one or two casualties, not where you'll have instances in Ukraine where half the platoons wiped out and yep. you've got mass has instantly. And I think that's come from, we don't need that many tourniquets or that much quick clot or this because well, we've got one or two CAS for a lot of guys rather than rolling and go, no, 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 you can have 20 guys out of 30 wiped out in a shell strike yep. and instantly you have to do your sort and see of triage. Who can I actually save? Because it doesn't matter how much, you can have a truckload of med kit and you haven't got enough. Um, it actually come to groups with that happening. Yeah, definitely. Um, I also th- I found another thing. So the, that qualification that I had was like a combat medic qualification. Mm-hmm. And the way the US runs is they kind of have their all service provider, which is like AFA, mm-hmm. CLS, which is like combat first aider. But there's some differences like they don't carry drugs, they don't cannulate, don't carry fluids. Yeah. Uh, and then they have combat medic. Right. So like the combat medic dude in, is sitting, he's still an infantry soldier, but is as far as my knowledge stretches, but uh, he's still an infantry soldier. He just sits further away from the conflict. You obviously got your CLSs within teams and then you're just normal guys who know the AFA stuff. Yeah. Um, and so having that third level, this CLS, uh, not CLS, CLS is obviously in the group potentially carrying the med bag, but the combat medic at the back has antibiotics, has an ability for eye gel to like intubate the person and put them on a VVM, um, carries like ketamine, fentanyl, or like a lot of, uh, different drugs and even like the dudes in the teams will have combat pill packs in their IFAX. I don't know if you Australia ever operated with those overseas. No, not combat no. pill packs. So you'd be like a, um, uh, a very light, um, painkiller similar to like a, uh, a Panadol, I guess you could okay, say, right. uh, a very broad spectrum antibiotic and then, um, another, um, uh, pills That's lost good. my mind right yeah. now, but, uh, yeah, the main one is that antibiotic and mm. especially now that we're going to, we're going to walk into some spaces where we can't meet people in the golden hour. We can't yeah. get people back. Well, this was going to be my next question. Yeah. I spoke to something you actually know, um, the American Gopnik last yep. night, um, and him speaking about, we have this illusion and it comes from us previously having air superiority that Kazavak Medivac is within the hour. Yeah. And in Buckmoot, we're saying, if you're injured in the morning, we're not moving you till it's dark. And if it's 7 a.m., you've got 16 hours, mate, to live. Like, and you need to leave till we can get you out. And that extended care, pro- prolonged care, is what we really lack. Yeah, and that's why I'm, I'm speaking about this kind of like the three-stage that they have instead of us with just like a two-stage and then mm. straight to the medic. Because they still have the medic that comes in the Kazavak vehicle, but that dude who's going to wait there with the casualty, with like the extended care kind of um, stuff that they can use, like IOs as well, would be able to drill into the bone in, if they can't get an IV, or yeah. um, potentially that person knows how to like give blood or take blood, or um, you know utilize blood products, which is going to be the craziest thing to um, give someone to save their life uh, in that prolonged care period. Um, but yeah, integrating something like that because uh, I just, in my head, okay, we go to the jungle, we're in PNG or wherever we are in Australia and someone gets injured. Like, wouldn't you want someone there who knows how to have all this stuff? Yeah. Because you might not be able to get out of the jungle. Like, it's going to be a walk out. Mm. You could be walking out for hours. There's no way there's a medic with a PMVA sitting there who's going to drive up and like... Nothing against females, but uh, good luck carrying fucking, you know, Dave from 3RER who's 150 kilos with all his stuff on. Yeah. It's like you need a guy who's ready to fucking do that work. 
um, and and who knows all this stuff about prolonged care because like yeah we don't have air superiority um, for example in Ukraine it was like the Russians could literally hold you in a position and you're not going to move like they could just fix you in place with shelling and they could just if they decided to right now they could just shell you for the rest of the time you're in that pit yeah like they'll just continuously shell 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 because they have the ammunition no one's like no one apart from counter battery no one's going to stop that from happening yeah they can fly a drone over the top of you and then before that drone runs out of battery they'll just bring another drone over mm. so you're always observed so we're just stepping into this world now with conventional space even if we're fighting an unconventional force in the jungle somewhere but um even then it's still applicable to have this prolonged care is you know we had guys who uh would get injured and the kazavak vehicles might get hit like what happens then the pmva is not coming for you anymore it's going to be another eight hours before we find another vehicle or um maybe for the mission they just don't like the injury isn't really that bad and they're like we're just gonna we can't afford to risk losing you guys we'll come pick the casualty up when we pick you up from the end of the mission yeah or something like that you know a lot of different scenarios but yeah i definitely think that we need to have a good thought about how we're going to integrate prolonged care on that conventional stage sf doing sf things let them let them do their stuff that's their job but yeah. for us like we have to, we have to operate differently we need to stop looking towards sf for all our answers mm. and start looking inwards towards ourselves. Like my team leader always said great guy shout out but uh <laughs> he always said the the grass is always greener where you water it you know yeah. it's not the grass is greener on the other side mm. so um yeah we need to invest in ourselves and especially in the rer and we've got the, we've got this shit. like the sas do I, i'm fairly confident it's called patrol medic schools yeah that is is that because well the australian sas hold the record in my uh, i'm fairly sure for the longest patrol in afghanistan it was like 50 days or something and the job they do that is this long range reconnaissance surveillance operations in jungles anywhere in the world is exactly that sort of prolonged care. And it's not like we don't have guys that know exactly what to do with these prolonged care, even down to uh, American Gold thing last night was saying about keeping the patient warm. Yeah, like, that's a huge one. You know, yeah. putting, a, putting a bloody space blanket on them. How many guys carry a space blanket? Like, yeah, like, yeah, like I'm going to run out of them eventually, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's fucking, it's very... A little micro eye fact with you. Oh, okay. I'm going to shout out to the thinking digger on Instagram because oh, yeah. I... I'm pretty sure that was his handle, but I, uh, I messaged him because he posted a, a photo of his microwave vac mm. that he got issued, and uh, it had like two eye cups to cover your eyes, <laughs> yeah. uh, one tourniquet and one chest seal or something like that. I messaged him like, mate, take that post down. Nothing against him, um, but I was like, you know, just because that's what you got issued doesn't mean that you have influence over social media. Mm. You should be putting out what the gold standard of an eye vac should look like. So if you do have that young lid digger who's looking on at your IFAC, like he shouldn't look at eye cups and even consider that to put that in his IFAC. Yeah. Like get rid of that. I never carried an eye cup in Ukraine because you can just put their safety glasses on them and there you go, you got eye cups, you know? And if it's anything like that crazy, that's like a protruding object or something like that, like it's just so rare to have that kind of injury. I'd rather carry something more important, um, you know, more quick lot more chest seals more something you know yeah something and, actually and useful you may do like if you've got a protruding object bandages out. you can <laughs> yeah. make a donut bandage and keep it in place so you can you know yeah. it's, it's one of those you will yeah if you're confident in your ability you will make it work if yeah. that makes sense and can you tell us about treating some of these casualties and sort of what you went through how you felt uh, yeah, I can actually talk about my first casualty because it's a bit of an in, uh, interesting mission. The, so the, the mission um, was another assault and uh, it kind of got fucked up. Like it just didn't go to plan. We got pinned for a long time and then uh, it eventually ended up being our withdrawal. But as we, so <laughs> fun thing, I actually, uh, we rode in on an M113. Hell yeah. Uh, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a day of assault where you bounce around. It was yeah. like to the vehicle drop off point and get out and then walk to the location. Yeah. But um, Vietnam, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I was lads. I was in a carrier. Fuck a yeah, CCR plane. It does not feel good. Like it feels horrible in a carrier. You're like, oh, I'm gonna fucking yeah, die. Yeah, this is five yeah. mil of aluminium. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. You're like, oh. this sucks. <laughs> yeah. And having your life in someone else's hands sucks as well because yeah. you're like, oh, I want to be able to control my, my death, not you. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, dudes burn the 
burn to death in the back of these vehicles and get melted and stuff so yeah it's not a fun not a fun thing but anyway um so if we go we get out of the m113 and uh, again i think i was on qrf for this one as well um but i was the leader of this like four man qrf group so i had to actually make some decisions um but yeah, so we've kind of dropped off and uh, just occupied a position while we wait for the section to push up. And then we're going to bound, obviously, in, in the rear and just be that tactical bound behind them just so we're always ready. Uh, and then, yeah, we got pinned. We got smacked. Uh, that's actually where that video is from on my Instagram, the shell coming in. It's just us sitting there for a couple of hours just getting absolutely like, hammered, have FPVs flying in and all sorts of wacky stuff. But yeah. Um, yeah, just before we'd occupied that position, that M113 got retasked and um, and a K-52 like helicopter flew in and sent a, uh, I don't know what, it's the equivalent of the Hellfire. Hellfire, I don't know what yeah. their Hellfire missile is called, but hit that vehicle and um, the two guys survived and they got out uh, and I didn't end up seeing them. They, they were all melted and everything and, and some of the boys directed them back to our CCP location. But um, yeah, they, they missed me. But that was the reason that we now had to walk out because our transport had just blown up. Um, so we're like, shit, okay. So everything has just gone completely wrong. The mission has just like not worked. Um, our transport's blown up. And uh, yeah, it was just kind of like, all right, cut and run and just give up and head home, I guess, which is kind of really a shitty feeling because... I wanted, like, personally, on a personal level, I wanted to stick out there and go again, but uh, I don't make the decisions, so. Um, so anyway, yeah, so we ended up having to walk back, and as we're walking back, we're walking along the road that we normally drive in. Um, normally, you're in a vehicle, so you don't really get to see the outside, but as I'm walking along this path, it's just, like, vehicles just destroyed everywhere, just, like, skeletons of vehicles. I even saw, like, three, it's, like, BMP-1s that were in, like, a, a harbour, like exactly how I'd seen like a carriers or something like that harbor up. And I was like, Oh man, like, I don't know if they were like, you'd see vehicles, one vehicle would be trying to like, we flipped and the other one you could tell was coming to like pick it up and they both get crumped yeah. or there's all these this is skeletons of vehicles. And as we're walking up this uh, hill uh, or just about to walk up the hill, there's, we were being targeted a little bit. So we had some shells um, coming close and uh we were a pretty big coal sign as well we split up in half but it was still like a large coal sign so we still had drones and things cut like they just lob rounds like there's a round over here and a round over there very rarely you get like pinned right. especially on the x-fill anyway not rarely sorry i may have not said that correctly but anyway we're walking up and this shell had gone over the top of our heads and like 150 meters up the road, it hit like smack bang in the center of the road. So if we were a little faster, like I'd definitely be dead. Um, and I saw the perfect fireball. My GoPro wasn't recording and I was like, for fuck's sake. Yeah, that sucks. But just as we got to where that show had landed, um, we're kind of walking in. It, you pretty much walk away in single file because of the mine threat. So he's walking in single file. I'm like the third last dude with my QRF, two QRF dudes behind me. And then... Uh, all of a sudden, I just hear like Ukrainians just yelling, and I was like, "What the fuck?" But it wasn't like pain yelling; it was like, like angry. And I had watched a podcast before I went over, similar scenario, but the guys got shot up. Like the Ukrainians were yelling like the password or something for that day. Yeah. And um, these guys, whatever, didn't know, and they like it was a blue and blue. So in that moment, I thought straight back to the podcast, yeah. and I was like, "Oh fuck." It's a blue on blue. Like, what the fuck's going to happen? Yeah. So I look back and the, one of the guys is a Ukrainian behind me. Um, and I was like, Do you, can you hear what's going on? I'm like, nah, I don't know what's going on. I'm like, fuck, all right. And then from the front of the stack, there's someone yelling, bring a Ukrainian up here, like translate. Runs all the way up. And then uh, turns out these two dudes were like, I think from that shell, had some frag, had like spun out and hit this dude in the leg. Um, and they were yelling 300. So, which is like, if you don't know, 300 is like the Ukrainian call for injured, wounded, and 200 is dead. So it's how you can like label someone if they're uh, KIA or yep. if they're injured. Uh, so yeah, they were yelling 300. So me and the other medic, uh, very qualified, smart dude, uh, we push up and we go find him. And there's just this kind of dude and the other Ukrainian just laying there on the ground and he's wailing about, he's all... Uh, 
quite upset with what's happened to him. Um, and honestly, like, it's a bit weird to think back. I just, it was a very weird reaction, but I laughed. I was like, I just, I thought it was funny because I, I immediately saw the injury wasn't that serious. Yeah. Uh, he'd torn a his leg, the bandaged, like, not trying to, you know, I don't know. It just sounds like it's coming across weird. No, but no, 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 it's no, a no, weird it's, thing. And I just was yeah. like, I just like smirked and just giggled at it. Cause I was like, this is just kind of a funny, weird I yeah. just never thought I'd I'd react that way, mm. but yeah, I was like, oh, all right, okay. And I was kind of looking at it like, oh, do we treat? Like I was kind of just a bit like lost. I was like, um. And then uh, the other guy, very smart dude, just was, went over and um, started taking the bandage off. And then I just started working on his uh, head and just body, just checking to make sure he didn't actually get injured anywhere else or anything else we didn't know about. Um, and then he just checked the, the actual wound to make sure that like we didn't need to pack it or do anything else. Um, and yeah, just checked his body and, and he was completely fine. He was just wailing about, there's a small little, little shrapnel in the, uh, it was like the ankle, ankle area. And, uh, I just said to him, I was like, Hey man, do you want some pain meds? Yep, sure. So I reached into my uh, pouch, pulled out some fentanyl lozenges and dropped it in his mouth. They had their Kazvac already coming and everything like that. So uh, we were pretty confident we could continue moving on and they didn't actually need help. But they were very panicked and stressed. And like looking back on it now, like, you know, poor guys, like he was panicked and stressed and, yeah. and it would have been a scary moment for him getting injured. Mm. I, I was never injured. So, you know, I don't know what it feels like. But, um, but for him, it was obviously like a bit scary occasion for him. But for me, it's just like, all right, mate, like settle down, <laughs> like, yeah. relax. It's not that bad. That's the Aussies, mate. Yeah, I was like, hey, hey relax, dude, like yeah. chill, like it's fine. And I, I also wanted to come across like it wasn't that bad as well because if you walk in and you're on a casualty and you're like, ah, <laughs> you know, yeah. shaking him up, I'm like, holy fuck, like we need to move. Fun. It's fine, dude. Like he wasn't bleeding. There was a tourniquet. We were thinking about doing a tourniquet conversion. Mm -hmm. so that's another thing I would love to see integrate somewhere within the RER. Just um, like the wound didn't look like it was an arterial bleed. So there might not be a need for a tourniquet. Yep. So you can actually remove the tourniquet uh, as long as there's a pressure bandage on there and just check to see like if it bleeds, mm -hmm. you, you pack the wound and some other stuff. But yeah, we didn't, we were like, oh, the Kazavak's coming and it's not worth having to do this kind of thing on this guy and we can just continue on. Plus we had shells that were like sporadically here and there and it was just wasn't worth um, sticking around to try and like help this guy that didn't need help. Yeah. Yeah, so we just pushed up the road and continued on. Mm. Yeah. Oh, fucking. It's awesome. Man. But that was my first little casualty, and, and uh, yeah, I was like, oh, that's it. Like, okay. Mm. Like, yeah, I think there's uh, it's probably the same thing about like soldiers who think that you can only feel um, satisfied with your career if you've killed someone. Mm. And I think it's the same thing for medics. You only feel satisfied in your career if you've treated someone. Yeah. But, um, but no, it's just like, oh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. It shouldn't matter, right? It shouldn't. It's just it's just another day. It's your job. You just continue on. It's not a big deal. Did you lose anyone that you're working on at any point? Uh, not. Our unit lost people, but not that I, I ever worked on or anything like yeah. that. No. Um, yeah. From your time over there, what do you think that the Ukrainians do well and that they do poorly? Oof. Um, yeah, I think, like I said, the drone integration is like, this. it's just, it just works. Mm. It perfectly works. Um, I think they also run the social media well as well. Yeah. I think if you'll notice um, on Instagram and Facebook, our current defense force decides that like, oh, they don't lean into it. They kind of, uh, which I think they should, I think they should lean into it, but they decide to just try and like mass report and take pages down. And from memory, they're still trying to take down Pineapple Express, even though they don't even post memes anymore. They're just like a veteran community. Yeah, they've done more for veteran community yeah. than even any other NGO in Australia or any other veterans network. Like so to me, it makes no sense. And I think that's what Ukraine does well. It's like managers, like, for example, myself, who can create a social media, like a lot of guys do. And like, to some degree, it, like people look at it a different way and, and whatever. But um, you'll always see, like, you probably don't know if you're just in Australia, but in Ukraine, you're around those circles. Everyone's always posting, like, hey, my vehicle's been blown up. Um, anyone would like to donate to try and get this done so our unit can continue working? Or this guy got injured, let's get him a flight home. 
or whatever the, the thing is. And I think that's what they do well in social media and then controlling the narrative as well so that they can post like their funk music combat footage stuff and uh, get more people on their side and um, tickle that community who just wants to watch, like, I don't know, people blowing up on drone footage for, for some reason. Um, Do you think that can have an effect, though, when of sort of scripting the reality of what's actually happening at the front line? Yeah, so I definitely think that, like, like I said, I think they do it well because the government needs that so they can continue the war and for, the war the war needs yeah the war needs to stay popular in ukraine so that more people sign up and more people fight because uh it is a good cause like russia isn't does not deserve to own ukraine i never met a ukrainian who wants to be owned by russia like no one wants russian control so um that's what i think they do well but yeah on one hand it is like a weird a very weird thing where they do they can control the narrative, but so can everyone. So, like, defense was controlling the narrative on uh, SAS in Afghanistan for how long? And then as soon as someone uh, spits it out for a little while with a you know, soldier C running around Afghanistan, then um, suddenly, like, oh, it's like, oh, now it's a bad thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think every country controls the narrative, and I think everyone, every country is guilty of it. Um, but, yeah, I do think that Ukraine does it well. Russia also like does it kind of well as well. I mean, they're posting footage of them pissing on a Bushmaster, you know. And to me, that pisses me off because I'm like, "Fuck you!" I'm like, "Fuck you, Russia!" I'm like, don't piss on my fucking Bushmaster. <laughs> I'll go fucking get it back from me. Piss on, I'll piss on my own Bushmaster. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. Don't make me come in there and get it. But uh, but yeah, and because you'll see, I'm sure you're well aware of this. You'll see on both sides, um, they'll be posting footage of of something that's just not even real. Like, I know I've definitely seen a lot of Russian stuff that it's like they fake a scenario where there's a war crime or they fake something. Um, yeah, it, it happens. It's just, it's propaganda. And just remember that if Australia goes to a, a real war, it's what we'll be doing as well. Like, we're not going to be shy of this. So you can't point fingers at someone else that, you know, America and us are willing to do it at a moment's notice. 9-11 was an inside job. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, though, some of these things that have come out from Ukraine have been severely damaging, though, too. Like, I, I think for me, there was a big turning point in my how I saw things when, like, it was a, a Ukrainian S-300 missile land in Poland and killed the two farmers. Yeah. Which I'm like, I completely understand. You have the right to self-defense and air defense has gone over and killed people across a border that's very close. Yeah. It, it's shocking that those people have died, but uh, it's not like I'm pointing fingers at Ukraine. It's like, well, if the Russian missile was never there, you never had to have fired it. But don't then spin around and go, well, no, it's not us yeah. at all. I think that, and still to this day, Zelensky at all have never admitted that, and that's Russian, it's Russian, it's Russian, even though the US, Poland, everyone's gone, it's okay, but it's definitely fucking yours. Yeah. I think that was like a, for a lot of people, especially myself, a bit of an instance of like, what else is bullshit here? Um, and that's what then Russia plays into, is they'll push on that nerve of, well, it all is fake. It's all fake. You know, this, this, this. And I think done well, your propaganda be well, but it's always a degree away from being very damaging and dangerous as well. Definitely, yeah. Especially if it can actually be proven incorrect. But where is that line? It's so, it's so hard. yeah. Yeah, I think it's just something we're not even used to. We're not ready for the amount of misinformation or the, like trying to sway public perception because what if the public took that a different way and was like, oh, it was Russia. And then the narrative that was like, it wasn't Russia or mm. yeah, it, it's it's very interesting. And I don't think we are, I don't think the West is truly ready. For, the US definitely is, but, yeah. but we aren't. Uh, even our population, we aren't because um, I even think now if you, Put up some videos and um i know <laughs> i know there are definitely groups out there that have conspiracy theories and all sorts about defense there was conspiracy theories that like we were gonna lock people up and like give them the covid jab like so the misinformation's out there um in terms of ukraine i don't know it's it's just one of those things isn't it like everyone's got to play the game yeah. like everyone's got to play the misinformation game and, and it's a game of war and it's a game of support and um uh, yeah uh, 
I try and stay out of politics, you yeah. know, I'm just yeah. a soldier, you know, crazy, crazy amount of stuff that goes on. <laughs> well, I think we haven't even seen the beginning of it yet. Like I, no. AI is still recognisable when it's fake. You yeah. can still be like, mm, well, it looks a bit off. But I tell you, we're a year away from being completely like unrecognisable what's real, what's fake. And that's going to be a, like, what if Zelensky comes on the TV and it is an AI gun that is, oh yeah, no, the war's over, everyone walk off to the positions, blah, blah, blah. It can happen. Yeah. Like, like that shit is going to be a huge problem. And when the what a footage can be looked that real, like you can notice when something is a fake bit of footage. Or, but eventually we're not going to have that either. And we, we currently, and humans, we can believe our eyes, but not for that long. I, I, don't think, I think that is going to be a huge change in an information space. And I'm concerned because, well, the more information you have available to use for that AI algorithm, the better it's going to be. And this is why the best AI stuff is like, say, Joe Rogan, because he's got 5,000 episodes and they can, every, he said every word yeah. ever and, you know, they've got the pacing room down and I'm like, well, there's going to be plenty of footage of me if someone put that next and I'm just spouting <laughs> off bullshit. Hopefully it's good enough I can just not make videos anymore and it's just me, it's just <laughs> something. But like, yeah, I think that's going to be a big step as well. Yeah, potentially, uh, you know, just for legal reasons, this is completely AI interview exactly. and, and i'm not actually here and <laughs> exactly i've got i've got that good tech yeah, yeah um well what do you think that ukraine does poorly um god uh obviously like on a soldier level um because that's probably what i most saw mm. i i can't speak like crazy in depth about how they operate as a government or other things but as a soldier level obviously they need to um bring up their training, like having their level of training to be in an infantry standard, like in Australia would be perfect, you know, trigger discipline and like shooting standards and, and having these slick new drills would be perfect. So they definitely like on a soldier level, all of them, um, almost all of them, there's like some really good units out there in Ukraine, but you know, majority of their military definitely needs to bring that standard up. And that's what a lot of foreigners are there doing. Um, but other than like the soldier level uh again it just goes probably to back to social media like there's always people posting stuff that shouldn't be posted um like current troop locations or uh you know i never want to be seen as this but like the instagrammers who are like you know um like getting out of their trench to go film a funny video or something like that yeah uh when the job's on you know um the job's on the job's on you should be sticking to it there's a time and place um so yeah no i definitely think that uh that's probably another area is just that information because you can't really control that and i know our military would probably just take our phones away from us yeah. if we were uh deploying somewhere but um but yeah ukraine obviously everyone has a phone everyone's you know doing their business so yeah that's probably big space they need to improve on and if you want an example of where like you know the social media is run well by one and shockingly by the other is look at israel uh, hamas that israel's media space is shocking they they have it's not they have nothing it, it sucks like the idf has an official thing and it's like official statements and no one gives a shit yeah where ukraine does really well with like yeah nafo sort of uh, and your parody accounts taking the piss and doing this they do really well yeah and hamas have you know the the red triangle of striking vehicles and stuff that is really recognizable and that propaganda draws people that way and israel's shocking at doing it um and that's why so many more people are swinging on to this well calling the organization there the resistance which is just the resistance don't do what they did but it, 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 that's i think a good example when you can see where misinformation disinformation campaigns are run well or poorly or just campaigns in general what do you think about the command in or in your time in ukraine because what i hear about a lot of guys is there's a lot of incompetent command that if they could improve anything it's like that nco senior nco officer level that is and i've got messages only this morning of guys going are the guys there fighting the the incompetence of that middle command is is the current issue what do you make of that at least in your experience i don't know experiences yeah very yeah that's definitely an experiences very thing because i had a quite pleasant experience actually mm -hmm. and i've definitely heard the stories and met dudes who haven't but um yeah my commander at like uh that kind of lieutenant level a bit higher 
uh, was very competent, you know, ex like legitimate SF dude, um, like been to work, done it all kind of thing. Uh, and even down to the team level, leader level, like everyone in this unit that I was a part of was ex-military, bar like a couple of medical or drone operators. Yeah. So you're looking at like everyone has served and is most likely qualified in some little way within their NATO military. And, um, and we're at a point in the war now where guys know what they're doing. Like, it's not like, like I said, you don't just get a weapon and go for it. It's like there's mission planning, like intelligence briefs. And um, like, I'm getting a brief almost every day about what happened the day previously or like what new thing, what um, path or road we can't take anymore or something like that. So uh, at that command level, even uh, orders, like there was orders being written that were like a coker and salute him. So I'm sitting there like, oh, like, perfect, you know? Uh, not, maybe not a coker, but definitely um, the SMEAC kind of thing of like, yeah. here's the situation, mission execution, uh, admin log. But yeah, no, I, I had a pleasant experience. I never met anyone that I wouldn't serve under. Um, sometimes there are issues with like, uh, well, this guy's not here right now or he's left or someone might have died or something like that. So... Uh, someone might step into the place and they might not be qualified like as a good team leader. But, you know, you figure it out and you, you work with it and you just massage yourself onto the ground and and do that kind of thing. Yeah, so it's it's not... It was... I never saw an issue. Yeah. yeah. Did you have any issues with uh, corruption in, in Ukraine? Um, honestly, like, not... Like... I, nothing I can directly say that I saw or did anything or whatever, but uh, foreigners. Foreigners were the actual the actual problem. Uh, it was at one point in time, there was a guy that we were actually trying to track down who um, was selling, he would get donated uh, vehicles or something at the border and then we'd try and sell them. Or there was a, another guy who... Um, who we were trying to get actually find out where he was so we could report him in. Uh, and he was like, he'd just send you photos on Telegram or whatever it was of this vehicle. And then he'd come up with some bullshit story about how he's in the military and he's like part of this massive defense company that just like sells vehicles really cheap. You pay half now and then you'll pay the other half when you get it. And I was like, I knew, I was like, this guy's fucking dumb. Like, this is so stupid. Uh, so we're like, let's see if we can find where this dude is, bag and tag him and throw him to the authorities. But we couldn't. Uh, he, I think he already left the country by then. Yeah. But yeah, the, the corruption I saw was like on that foreigner side, which is really sad um, because there are foreigners doing a lot of good work. But yeah, there's bad apples for sure. We've seen that there's been foreigners in Ukraine involved in incidents within, within units of foreigners being tortured, murdered, by other foreigners, other units, whatever. Mm -hmm. There's been a couple of famous incidents only recently with someone that was found waterboarded because they found him in water, but it wasn't the water in his lungs from there. What do you make of those of those incidents happening? Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know much about that topic really. So, um, no, I, I couldn't really make comment, honestly, about... Um, about those kind of things that happen because uh, I will just say for for foreigners, just understand that you're not in your home country and, um, you know, you need to be careful and understand where you are. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah, you just don't want to make the wrong decisions or get caught up in the wrong thing and just do the right thing, be there to help Ukraine and don't involve yourself in, uh, in any wrongdoings. That would be... Uh, yeah, I don't know anything about any of these kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that is important, you know, that the SBU work differently to ACES work. Oh, yeah. It's not like the, a police officer comes and knocks on your door and sits down with you and I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. It's more likely that you're going to just get swept up and off you go somewhere, you'll figure it out. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And how do you feel about that, like being, being a foreigner – yeah. Um, you just, like I said, you just have to know, like I have to know that it's like, well, I'm not in Australia. I'm not going to walk around and talk shit to everyone. I'm going to try and please everyone and, and you know, um, someone has a different opinion about me. I'm not going to get angry at them, you know. I just blow it off. So what, man? Like, we'll move on. I'm here to do, we both have a common goal, 
you know, or um, or you see something that you're not meant to, or whatever it is, like, uh, like it's yeah, it's just not something that um, I went over to involve myself with or anything like that. And uh, yeah, no, it's I never saw anything like that either. But people who find themselves in those situations, because there are you know documented um, things now, I think you've definitely done. Uh, a little thing about it as well yeah i just it's just it's a weird i don't really know how to explain it honestly yeah it's just just be careful and understand where you are that's it you're not in australia anymore you're in ukraine and they operate different it's like if i go to america or if i go to i've been to morocco like if you go to morocco it's different there just you have to look around and realize you're not in the western country anymore yeah what experience have you had in Ukraine with like these right sector groups that we hear about and, and was reported on by the mainstream you know, up until the invasion of the, in 2022 and then it just doesn't exist yeah. where as, as everyone as anyone knows that a war invasion like that doesn't make that go away it makes it worse mm-hmm. what experience if any have you had with that and how do you view that going forward um, I know they exist, but I didn't have anything to do with any um, like extremist groups or anything like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I just think that a lot of like young people get caught up in the wantingness to belong, and so they might find themselves in these groups. And always, I'll tell everyone: don't don't ever go into any of those groups. Like, don't stray into that because uh, if you want to like work in ukraine there are better options you don't have to go into this extremist groups or anything like that and be labeled anything crazy um so yeah no they they exist and uh funnily enough some of them will be the like the hardest fighters you know they'll be fighting the hardest and willing to take the most casualties and do the most you know, fucked up work um because that's kind of like how they brand themselves but uh so yeah, they are like an effective fighting force, but on the other hand, yeah, they don't stand for the right things. And I, even people in Ukraine know that as well. Like no one in Ukraine is is looking at these groups like, oh, they're outstanding citizens. Mm. It's just like one of those um, double-edged swords. The enemy, I guess. The enemy's my it, friend. It, yeah, it is. It is really like that. And I think after the war, we'll easily see some of these groups that could be labelled as this just be disseminated or mm. or dealt with accordingly by the government. I. I I have trust in Ukraine that they'll they will do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're going to need to if if Ukraine has ambition, which of course we know, to join the EU and NATO. Yeah. You can't have those groups within the EU NATO structure. That yep. those structures are like the most cucky thing ever. Realistic, like they yeah. to get in. Yeah. Um. That yeah, those groups are going to have to be disseminated. And I've I've actually had a bit of concern about how's that actually going to look at the end of this conflict. You've had these guys that have fought like hell for years. Yeah. And of course the spirit of core, like your um, passion in your unit just becomes more and more and more the more you have dealt with this, that then at the end of it, well, you shouldn't exist anymore. And it's like, well, we fought for your freedom. Yeah. I have concern how that's going to look. Yeah. They've already started to um, to fix this issue. Uh, I don't know if it was exactly when I was over there, but uh, like, for example, Azov doesn't exist. It's third assault. It's been like mulled into the military yeah. so that the military can have control over this. And even to the point, like they're not seeking out um, extremists anymore. They seek they they recruit differently from like a military unit. They have their own recruitment, but it's like it's kind of like a there's no comparable thing. But it's like the standards will be higher to get into that unit. Yeah. So it's like a harder fighting unit. That you know you'll have to do like weeks or whatever it was of like a selection to get into this course to get into this group so that they'll. Um, Push it, but they integrated with that within the military so they can monitor that yeah um so there's no fire at extremism or anything like that that i saw i never worked with these groups anyway but um like from just my experience yeah i didn't didn't ever see that but i mean you could say the same thing for three rr para uh <laughs> dfsw um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there was some certain flags and things being flown or you know so uh i think that when you're in a military group there's always extremists. There's always people who are like, like settle down, mate. But that's what you do. You put them in the military so that you can look after that person. And at the end of the day, dude, you need people who are willing to do some like crazy stuff because war is disgusting. 
Like war is not a fun little game. It's it's disgusting what humans have to do to other humans. And uh, I've met a lot of guys who kind of, um, you know, did the GWAT experience and have had that break off out of the military and then now back into Ukraine. And they'll tell you that they weren't exactly uh, proud of their experience in, in Afghanistan and, and that uh, it was quite distressing to them. And, you know, um, like getting into stoops of depression, asking themselves why were they doing that? What, what was it all for? So having those kind of guys who are willing to go do this work, because you can do it and just not think about it, but doing it and actually wanting to keep doing it, extended periods of time, it's a, it takes a different kind of person to actually like do that. And sometimes like an extreme guy is going to be the guy who's willing to continue to do work. And if it's like fire, you know, it cooks your food perfect. But if it, you put it in a house and it catches, you know, you have to control it. You have to have control over these things. That's what our military does. Yeah. Well, that that's why Ukraine had to absorb Azov was they had to absorb it. One, to you know, keep the reins on it. Definitely. Uh, but also as well, because the West said they're not funding because Azov was one of the most lethal fighting forces in ukraine mm -hmm. and if the west said we're not funding that under that name then they had to absorb it into the military yep. for that to happen so there's a bit of politics going on there too oh, of course there, there are some interesting interesting groups um that get around and yeah we'll see what becomes of that i guess after and just quickly even even so like azov is pretty much been wiped out like everyone agrees now you like in the units that i was part of when we talk about azov we're like well None of the guys that were those extreme dudes are left. Like, yeah, they all died. Jail, That's what I was Russia, saying. All they've, they've been taken. They, out, yeah, they were the guys like in a line of BMP. Oh, you've interviewed uh, one of the guys who's yeah. yeah. So they just charge into these like hectic missions, mm -hmm. and they they do the work. They get it done. But yeah, they they most likely uh, none of them really make it back. Mm -hmm. So it's like, can you really blame three RAR DFSW right now for the things that happened ten years ago? Yeah. It's the same thing with this war. It's like everyone's rotated in and out, so they're not recruiting extremists. It's not It's not how it is. Right. Yeah. Do you get, because of course this is an interview where you're, you know, your identity will be hidden, do you ever get concerned about that with being in this war? Because I know right now how everyone views this war, uh, Western states. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, you cannot never predict the future of how this is going to be, how it's going to be looked back on in a number of years. We don't know where where this will actually end. And of course, you know, we, we like to make out like Russia's got no allies, which we know is fake. Look at how Putin arrived in Saudi Arabia to literally a rock star entrance and Germans bloody bloke was left there on the plane, no one rocked up. Um, do you ever get concerned about, you know, how this is looked at as if you're gonna be on a watch list somewhere in Australia or or traveling and working internationally? Yeah, uh, just for context, Tracker Nazi is like uh, um, a pro-Russian, open source intelligence type thing where they just track foreigners down. They believe that every foreigner that goes to Ukraine or fights in Ukraine is a Nazi, even though they're not. Um, but so track a Nazi is like one of the main things people talk about over there. It's, uh, and that's something I, I want to actively not get onto or have my identity leaked. So I do my own measures to try and make sure that uh, I don't have my identity leaked. I'm not really concerned about Australia. It doesn't bother me. Um, I think I'm proud to have done what I've done. And and uh, I think right now Australia has those views and they're my views. Um, but in the future, I understand opinions change and, and uh, I'll come to that when it comes, if it does. And it just might mean that I might not be able to go into some countries because uh, not every country is pro-Russian, uh, sorry, pro-Ukrainian a lot of pro-russian countries uh i actually was quite concerned i actually went uh through a travel visa through china and i thought that china was going to pick me up um but they didn't so i was very like surprised i guess because we were told in taiwan that um they were gonna like you're gonna get questioned 100 percent, and then we didn't so yeah. um yeah that's actually I got a funny story about that so yeah, we only went through China because it was a cheaper flight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so we had the, ch and so normal countries just do like a travel uh, visa. It's like you just land in the country and then you can get on your next flight without having to enter the country. Yes. China doesn't, and I didn't know this. So you have to actually enter through China, 
get the one day travel visa, go all the way in and then all the way out of their security. Yeah. So we almost missed our flight, which would have been horrible. But we, so I obviously have to get my everything scanned, my fingerprints to get into their like social credit system. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm on the system and, but yeah, we, we were walking, me and my friend who I was with, we actually got lost in the airport because it's like, oh, I head to the third service desk for transfer. And so we're just walking through this like back of this airport. Like this is definitely not where we're meant to be. Yeah. And you walk and there's cameras everywhere. Have you ever been to China? Yeah. 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 And it's just cameras everywhere. And it's like, oh my God, like it's real. Like people are actually like being monitored like all the time. Yeah. There. It's a black mirror episode. And yeah, it really is. And then we find this random elevator. I'm like to my friend, I'm like, we just, we just need to go up. Like we're in the wrong place. We just, if we go up and we click the button that says like back to where we need to be or something. We'd, so we jump in this elevator, go up and there's this chick standing there waiting for us. So she'd been, obviously they, they monitor us on the cameras where we're walking. We're yeah. like, who the fuck are these guys? <laughs> um, ex Ukrainian dudes uh, fighting in Ukraine. And um, she like immediately, it was like that little North Korean, like the fakeness. It was like, hello like passport and yeah. i was like what and uh handed my passport over and she looked at it like kind of like identified that it was me it's like oh yes come with me i'll take you and walked us directly to where we needed to go it was like yeah. no more looking around like time to go yeah and took us right to where we needed to take off and and off we went and uh yeah we were, we were like five minutes late to our flight which would be horrible if i had to stay in china yeah <laughs> yeah i can't imagine but yeah that was a funny experience for sure yeah i think there's going to be a lot of guys who limit where they can go following things like this especially yeah. with social media and then you know currently i don't know if i'd re-enter ukraine russia or belarus like, I, don't, I don't know if i can go in that area that yeah. zone uh like ukraine i think i'd be all right i like i think i'd be all right especially once the war ends mm. um especially if there's like an eu um being put in but you know it's it's one of those things it, it's it's difficult you know publicly when you speak about these things you speak about things like china where does you know where does that actually pop up down the line somewhere yeah true true yeah we have another 60 years you know like yeah i mean you never know with these things so uh yeah your actions have consequences gentlemen <laughs> like yeah. that's the reality yeah and even, yeah. even if it's true even if you're correct that's not other countries aren't the democracy of denmark no. or, or the freedom of media in the netherlands or the us or australia People will talk about our, our media's, you know, oh, it's corrupt and you can't say anything. Well, us being sitting here talking about this and shitting on the Australian Army for half an hour proves that it is also open media. It is but open like, media, yeah. You know, it, yeah. Yes, I have a big problem with how a lot of the Australian media runs. I, I do. But compared to most places in the world, it's actually pretty bloody good. <laughs> yeah. Constructive criticism. We're not shitting on the, like, the I government. I can call Albanese yeah. a knob. You can. The Prime Minister. You can. Like, I yeah. can be like, I think you're a knob. <laughs> and no one is going to bang on the door. Like, no, you know, no. It's not good neck, neck minute. But you try to do that about, well, look at Pogosian. <laughs> like, yeah. How that went through. I think that um, context matters too. Like, for example, you've got a following on YouTube. So your opinion influences others. So, because there are a lot of people that just go through this world reacting to what happens. Yes. They don't go through this world and they uh, they like plan and pre-plan and all sorts of things. Um, so, I think a lot of those people will watch it might be watch a video of yours and then have your opinion. Yeah. So, you know, you carry with you like a bit of a um, I don't know what whatever responsibility. The, yeah responsibility yeah. for your opinions because that might influence a lot of people. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, I met guys in Ukraine who knew about you and they weren't even Australian. So I was yeah. like, oh, people know Willie. Yeah. And they might base their opinion like, oh, Willie released this video and said this. Mm. Like, that's how he, you know, that's how you, because you can be as unbiased as you want. It's still biased, you know? Oh, yeah. Everything's yeah. biased. And it's the same with me. Like, it's the same with uh, Instagram accounts that, you know, poke fun at the Australian military or things like that, like uh, Missouri and Digger or any of those kind of pages. Um, which is fine, you're allowed to, but um, understand that your opinions have influence. Mm. And when your opinions have influence... I have a parcel. Oh. <laughs> Wait, yeah, yeah, I'll be back in a sec. Fuck you, Dave. Oh, sorry. Um, I was talking about, yeah, like opinions that 
carries a lot of weight now. Yeah, like the opinions of uh, an Instagram page, mm. like it might influence, like who's your audience? Is your audience a bunch of brand new guys joining the military? Mm. And then you're just going to make them jaded for the rest of their time they're in. So, um, yeah, I definitely think that like having influence, the influencer, you know, that's what it is. Um, your opinions, not to everyone. A lot of people will listen to this and just make their own opinions. But yeah. some people will just be like, well, Willie said this and... Willie said the, the war in Ukraine's winning or Willie said the war in Ukraine's losing and that's now their entire opinion. Yeah. And I've had to um, have words with people to try and be like, hey, mate, like you're just talking because you watched a five-second, uh, you know, video on Facebook or something like that. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to explain to you through like a bit of experience. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it, can be a, it can be a problem that and I think people, when they hear something they don't want to hear, they zone out too. Like, yeah. Like I've never got so much hate rather than the talk about Israel, Hamas. Yeah. And well, I can't enter Gaza. You cannot get into Gaza at the moment. Mm -hmm. And if I say, well, Hamas did this. No, they didn't. And you're like, well, that, but you don't want to hear that, but they did. I'm not saying that that calls for what's happened. Uh, it calls for our response. Is the response correct? Well, that's, you can make your own mind on that. But to just be like, I don't want, I don't want to hear that Hamas did these horrific acts. Therefore, I don't believe it happened, and you telling me is part of the, like the part of the problem. You're like, well, no, that's it's true. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. and there's so many instances of this where people they're set in their bias, and if you speak against that, it's like, no, oh, fuck you. Yeah, and you, you see this with a lot of social media, and I, I think I look at guys like Tucker Carlson, and I'm like, it's so weird. This so the lean into that audience, and I actually believe that's the way people actually grow on social media. Is better than you gotta lean into an audience, lean yeah. Into it. And I try and, and everyone hates a centrist. Everyone hates you being like, well, actually, this and this, like yeah. you know, things in Ukraine on the front line are not going well at the moment. It is not. There's ammunition shortages. There's problems in U.S. Congress. I think that'll get fixed, but just the fact of the matter is, right now, it's not going brilliantly. It's not going as well as we'd like. And on the other side, you go, well. Like in Russia fought like shit in the beginning of this compared to the size of it and they, you know, eighty percent got wiped out and this and and people on both sides of that right now have just gone, Well no, I'm, you know, Ukraine's fighting brilliantly, they're gonna be in Crimea in the next week and other people go, Well, Russia's gonna be in Kiev in two weeks and this and that and you're like, Fucking Jesus Christ. You you know but if you just lean into a narrative, you'll do better. It's 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 weird, but I'll take I'll take the hate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think uh and so many of these uh, conflicts are now becoming these conflicts of there's no good, it's only bad. Yeah. You know, war is bad and um, and the people who suffer the most are civilians. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if, if all civilians could just stop dying, please, you yeah. know, that's that's it. That's, yeah. the, that's the reality. And regardless of your opinion, that should be your opinion, yeah. is that as long as there are no more civilian casualties... Um, if you want to, you know, go one side or the other, that's, you know, your own uh, opinions and, and whatever you want. But the reality is, is like, can we just stop killing each other? Like, yeah. why can't we all just gather up for one big game of fucking chess or something? Yeah. you got to come from, settle the wars come from over a that. spot that civilians are always innocent. Yeah. Which is, which is where you should come from, but, you know, there's always going to be collateral damage, especially as weapons have got so much more deadly. Like, it's un unbelievable. Oh, it's those, horrible stuff, happened. man. Is, is there anything else you think we haven't spoken about that you'd like to speak about? Um, no, no, I think uh, I think that's pretty much covered it all. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's about it. Shout out to the, the lads fighting back in Ukraine. Um, like, I've had a, a couple mates. I've just had one mate like a week ago pass away. Um, so, yeah, as long as all, my goal on this podcast is really just get across to guys that like this isn't a game and i think you can say that and be like oh well, i knew that like no no no, mate like seriously like are you ready for your life to like you you're gonna lose your life your friend's life you know take someone else's life like just understand where you are and, and the reality of it all and um yeah really drive home and, and that's why i want um to stop this war in ukraine i just want the borders to go back to where they were and then just call it like no one's trying to fight. We just want it. Just cut it. <laughs> yeah, it's just sad. It's really is sad. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. Well, mate, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And uh, ah, your Instagram link and everything will be below. I'm sure some people will reach out and.
Will we end up on track and Nazi Merck as a blurry face? Yeah, yeah, probably. If one of the many guys we know who aren't dead, track and Nazi Merck is put as dead. Yeah, is Dave. Yeah, they think yeah. Dave was dead. Oh, um, I'm on there. I got put up a, a selfie of me and my girlfriend at the airport once, and I'm like, bro. <laughs> like, like, what? <laughs> like, uh, it's yeah, I had a lot of friends on Tracker Nazi, and if you're a foreigner and fighting Ukraine, stop messaging them. Just let them go. Yo, you're let them, gonna, you're yeah, you're not going to the situation. Yeah, stop telling them that you're going to kill them all. Like, just leave it. Just move on. Yeah. Like, it's not a big deal that you get on there, but yeah. But don't give them any more information. And this goes for just social media as a whole. Don't give anyone more information than is needed because the more you send them, they can get numbers, addresses, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And that's going to be a whole nother whole nother problem yeah yeah and for uh australians listening if you get dragged into a conflict in some uh foreign war that you're not a part of just remember that uh, there'll be groups like this that are trying to hunt you down mm -hmm. and trying to figure out where your family are and uh and ruin your life so just be careful what's on social media and what you post and if you've got photos of your uniform on tinder probably time to take it down yeah tinder or tiktok yeah fucking absolutely well, mate, thank you very much no, for almost two hours. No, mate, really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. Cheers, mate. Sweet.